All right. Well, our text this morning is um, relatively brief. Um, it's in Hebrews chapter 13. And I just want to read the first three verses. But the text itself is really just verse 2. And when I read it, perhaps you'll, you'll see more clearly why it is I chose to read the passage that I did from the book of Genesis. So Hebrews chapter 13, <clears throat> beginning in verse 1, the author to the Hebrews writes, Let love of the brethren continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. For by this, some have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember the prisoners as though in prison with them and those who were ill-treated, since you yourselves also are in the body. You know, there's a lot in, in those few verses, but again, we just want to focus on verse 2. Now, a few weeks ago in our Wednesday study, those of you who are present will remember that R.C. Sproul quoted uh, Martin Luther giving us a very important principle that should be true of us at all times and something we should be striving after, and that is every Christian is called to be Christ to his neighbor, uh, by which he meant, of course, that we are to follow Jesus' example by being a servant to our neighbor. Now, it's important for us that we do this because that is what Jesus wants us to do. Remember, Jesus lived the life that he did not only to save us, but to give us an example. And I think as we look through the pages of Scripture, we see that wherever he went, Jesus was a servant, which means that Jesus was showing hospitality. He was a servant to those he knew, and he was also a servant to those he didn't know. He wants us to do the same thing. He wants us to serve others. Now, it's also important because if we identify with Jesus, if we call ourselves Christians, and by the way, the word Christian means one who is like Christ, then that is what those who hear us are going to expect to see in us. They'll expect to see something that resembles Jesus. Now, they're not necessarily going to praise us if, if they see that because the, the Bible tells us that people, as, they're, as they come into this world, do not love Jesus. They don't want to see him. They don't want to have people living like him. But we also know that they'll certainly criticize us if we don't live like Jesus and we certainly don't want to cast aspersion on the gospel or appear to be hypocrites. But I think it's most important because, you know, that we live like Jesus or, uh, you know, live up to this name of, Chris, of Christ, which we can only do by the power of the Holy Spirit, because when people look at us, they are going to draw conclusions about Him. What we do reflects on Jesus, right, for good or for bad. So we need to make sure that we show the world what Jesus is really like. And I think that's what Paul meant when he said in 2 Corinthians 3, verses 2 and 3, he says, we are letters of Christ. You know, Jesus has essentially written on us. The blessing of the new covenant is have, to have the law of God written in our hearts and put in our minds so that we might become like him. Paul says we are letters of Christ known and read by all men. So we're, we're put on, you know, on display. We are examples of what Jesus is to be. People look at us and they read us. And what, of course, they're reading, or at least what they think they're reading, is what Jesus is like. Now, it's important for that reason, but it's also important for us as individuals in this fellowship. I think we all understand that, that we need examples. We need examples of people who are doing this. When we see somebody who is following Jesus, who is serving Jesus, who is reaching out to others like him and sacrificing like him, it encourages us to do the same thing. I think it encourages us more than any sermon that could be preached regarding this. I think we all know the importance of good examples. Now, this is really one of the many benefits of looking at church history and why we, we do what we do once a year with the Reformation series as we look at, at these biographies of godly men and women who have served the Lord because it encourages us to do exactly the same thing. We not only learn how to avoid the mistakes that the church has made through the years, but it encourages us to see that there were others who were outside the pages of Scripture, people who were just like us, who actually walked the walk, 
if I can put it in those terms. Now, I'm not saying that the people who were in the Bible were not like us, but I think you understand what I mean. You know, for some reason, we seem to think these were exceptional, but they were just men and women like we are. But again, as we see examples in history, it encourages us. We see so many bad examples every single day of our lives. We need good examples. And we need to be good examples to one another. Now, I think it goes without saying that it's also important that we be good examples for those outside the church. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16 in the Sermon on the Mount. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. We need to be Jesus to our neighbors. As, again, as Martin Luther said, Christ, as Christians, be Christ to your neighbors so that we might lead them to him, remembering that if they don't come to Jesus, they're going to have to pay for their own sins. And it's not popular to say it today, but if they have to pay for their sins, that means they're going to suffer forever in a fiery hell. That's what the Bible says. But I also, I want us to think about today about this particular point. It's important for those uh, that we be Christ to those who visit this fellowship. It's important that we show them the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think that's what the author to the Hebrews has in mind in our passage this morning when he says to the congregation in Hebrews 13, verse 2, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. Uh, this, this word, uh, show hospitality to strangers, is really just one word in the original language. It essentially means serving or showing kindness to those who are outside your immediate family, outside your extended family, outside your church family, outside your circle of friends, but specifically to people you don't know, to people who are strangers. Now, why is it that we are to do this? The author to the Hebrews gives this reason. Some have entertained angels without knowing it. Now, that statement is the reason why many believe that the author to the Hebrews was actually talking about that account of Abraham when he entertained the Lord and two angels. He didn't know that's what he was doing at first, but it's a good thing that he did it, you know, because uh, what would you want to be like if you turned away the Lord and two angels? Now, I don't think that um, uh, the Lord is necessarily telling us here that uh, he's planning on sending angels our way. Now, it's possible. You know, we don't know. The Lord might do that. But I do know that it's much more possible that he will send people to us, and we need to be ready to receive them, as Abraham received his visitors when they came to him. Now, most of us, or most who visit us, are already professing Christians, unless, of course, unbelievers are invited to the service sometimes, Sometimes that happens. The reason why the Lord sends those people to us is because he wants us to serve them. You know, one of the things Jesus will say to us when we stand before him on that great day of judgment in Matthew 25, 35 is this. I was a stranger and you invited me in. Now, we are to do this as individuals, of course, but I believe we're also supposed to do this as a church. As the Lord brings us visitors, either during our regular services or during the Reformation series, we need to invite them in. We need to serve them as Jesus served us. Remember, we were once strangers, weren't we, to the Lord Jesus. But he became a servant to us. He served us. He served us many years ago when he came into this world. He served us at the time of our conversion. Actually, he served us throughout our entire lives. Uh, he's the one who's been providing for us. He's the one who gave us his Holy Spirit so we could believe. He was the one who was a servant to us to save us. Think about the fact that all of us here at one time did not know one another, right? There was a time when we were strangers to one another. But through service to one another, we are now friends, okay? We are family in the Lord Jesus. Now, the question I want us to ask this morning is this, how can we serve our visitors? How can we serve people who come to us? Now, first of all, we need to think about why it is that people come uh, to the church because they, they come for a variety of reasons. I mean, some are here 
And, and really, I didn't know our, our guests were going to be here this morning, but it's a, it's a good example. They're from another church. They're from one of our sister churches in Monterey Bay. They're out of town and looking for a place to worship because they have a Reformed or maybe an OP background. They look for something that's familiar, something similar to what they're used to, and so they come. And, you know, we're thankful for that. We, we love to have folks from other churches visit us, and when they come, we should certainly welcome them. Uh, worship with them and enjoy that worship, serve them. We should be the ones hosting them. We should fellowship with them. And, of course, you know, with the hope that in some way we can encourage one another by our mutual faith. There was a couple who visited us uh, last Lord's Day that we, uh, we see come once a year. And um, they, they come to Modesto once a year, and they come to this church because it's a familiar church. We're not, you know, the same denomination, but it's one that's very similar uh, to this church. But they also came here because they wanted to introduce their in-laws to us in the hopes that perhaps they would begin uh, to attend as well. They wanted to get them rooted into a sound church. So some people come because this is familiar. You know, they're out of town. They're looking for a place to come. They come here when they come, we should welcome them. Uh, some visit us because they're looking for something more specific. Maybe they're looking for reformed teaching. You know, maybe they've listened to R.C. Sproul on the radio. Uh, even though he's with the Lord, he yet speaks, you know, through the, uh, the marvel of uh, recorded media. Maybe they heard Al Mohler. Maybe they heard John Piper. And so they wanted to check out a reformed church because now they're aware that there is actually more in the Bible than they originally thought, than their church had to offer them, and they want to learn more so that they can grow more. Now, that used to happen a lot more than it, it does today, but it still happens from time to time. And when that happens, we should pray that the Lord will bless them when they come through the ministry of His Word. And if they have any questions, we should be ready to help answer those questions. By the way, we shouldn't, we're going to see toward the end of the sermon we shouldn't grill them on their theology, but if they have some questions, you know, we should be ready and willing to help answer them or to point them to somebody who can answer those questions. Uh, maybe they came to the service because they were looking for some, uh, you know, some good worship. You know, good I put in quotation marks because people have differing ideas of how we should worship the Lord. Uh, for many today, that's the main thing that they want in a church. They want the music to be fun. They want it to be uplifting. Now, I think we all understand that music is very important. And I do think that we need to be excited by music to have our spirits lifted and our affections stirred. Jonathan Edwards once said, uh, as he was asking the question, why does the Lord want us to sing? Uh, why not just recite? Why not just do, you know, like the... Um, uh, the alternating reading of the psalm. Why are we singing? And he said, the only reason I can think of is because singing stirs the affections more than just about anything else. Now, our hearts do need to be stirred, but they need to be stirred then by more than just the music. You know, music can move our emotions, but only truth can stir the affections, and that is what we're after, stirring up godly affections. If I can share a personal example, uh, Donna and I, uh, used, when we first went to a Reformed church, it was a PCA that was very, very Reformed. Joey Pipe was the pastor. Having come out of a, cha a Calvary Chapel background and then churches kind of like that, that basically had the same style of worship, as we began to sing hymns accompanied by a piano and didn't have, you know, the other kind of instrumentation that we were used to, it seemed kind of dull, it seemed kind of flat, it seemed like we're going to have a hard time getting into this particularly compared to the way we were used to singing. But it wasn't long before we discovered why those who were attending that church preferred the hymns to the ones we were singing. You know, it wasn't so much the music, uh, you know, of those, of those hymns. I think we'd all, maybe, maybe not all of us would agree, but I think some of us would agree, our music could use some updating. But the words, you know, the words are so rich. The words are so full. They have so much truth. Now, I think that we need to be able to help people in that situation see the value of singing hymns that are rich with truth. And again, as I mentioned this morning, particularly those that express our love for the Lord in the way the Psalms actually teach us to do. 
Now, some visit us because they're looking for help. I think that's a very important point to think about. Maybe they're having struggles with their walk with the Lord. They want help in overcoming particular sins. They want to know how to draw nearer to the Lord. They want to be able to be more effective in reaching others with the gospel. Maybe they're struggling in their marriage. Or maybe like many of us, they're struggling with training their children and they're looking for help. Now, they come into the church to see if there is anyone here who can actually help them in these areas. So what can we do for these people who visit us in order to serve them? Well, we need to make sure that we're strong in these particular areas. We need to show them that by God's grace, we've been able to put Jesus on in, in these areas. Because if they come into the church for help in these particular areas and they see that we don't have it together, they see us struggling in the areas where they need the greatest help, guess what? They're, they're not going to stay for long, are they? They're, they're just going to move on and find another place that, that can help them. So we need to seek to be the best we can be for the Lord. Now, I think most people visit because they want to connect with other people. They're looking for somebody like them. I mean, I like to say that everybody who visits the church is looking for, you know, uh, the, the kind of teaching and preaching ministry that we have, but that, that, isn't, that isn't real. Some people do. But most of the people who come here don't necessarily do that. They're looking for people who are like them, that they can connect with, that they can become friends with, uh, people who are in their age bracket, people who share their interests. Uh, young people come in looking for a youth group. As a matter of fact, many parents who have young people come in looking for a youth group. Singles come in looking for other singles. The same is true of college age, young married, or older couples with children. Now, there's only so much we can do here if we don't happen to have, you know, those particular, you know, segments, those particular uh, groups of people. Uh, it's important, though, that we be here, you know, in order to connect with people, though, that we can connect with, people who are like us. You know, it is possible that, you know, if you have the choice to come or not come on a particular Sunday, and let's say you choose not to come, and then the Lord brings somebody who you would mesh, mesh with, let's say, perfectly. And you're not here. They're going to leave, and they're probably not going to come back because they didn't find anybody that they can connect with. Now, again, we all need to try to connect with everybody who comes in through the door. Uh, but if we have perhaps some of these cross segments, uh, you know, some of these things are true of us. We need to make sure that we're here so that we can connect with people who come to us. Uh, if, I mean, think about this. Parents have come, families have come, and they often come on days when any of the children we have are not here. And so they, they come into the service and they see no children, and so they don't, they don't come back. So if we have children, we should bring them uh, to the services. Now, not just because of that. We should bring them mainly because that's what our Lord calls us to do, to raise our children in the church with the hope that by God's blessing, they will come to know Him, and they'll want to continue then to come. You know, really, our, our children should have the sense that, that they've always been in the church, that that's always been a part of their lives. That's very important because what we're doing here is real. This isn't a fantasy. This, this is the ark that uh, the Lord, the people inside the ark are the people who are going to be saved from God's judgment. We need to get people in the ark. They don't have to be, of course, in this particular church in, in these four walls. They need to be in Jesus Christ. But the way they find him is typically by interacting with people who go to church or by coming to church. So we need to bring our children to church, again, in the hope that they might f find the Lord themselves because that's what the Lord calls us to do, but also to encourage those who have children to return so that they and their children will get to hear God's truth. And I think the same is true, again, if we have young, uh, young you know, youth in our, in our church or in our houses that are still in our households, we should also encourage them to come. If we want to minister to our visitors, we need to think about what they need and how we can help meet their needs. There's nothing wrong with meeting needs. You know, we, that's why we're here. We need to serve people. And as we're going to see in a moment, that's how we connect so we can do them some real 
good rather than just confronting them with the gospel as soon as they walk in through the door. Hopefully, they'll get that from the pulpit ministry. But before we share with them, we need to build relationship with them. You know, we need to be friendly to them. We need to show an interest in them. We need to treat them as guests of honor, treat them special, because that's what Jesus did, and that's what he calls us to do. But now, quickly, um, let me say this. Having seen what we should do, let's close with a few things that we need to avoid, things that will quickly turn people off so that they don't want to return. And sometimes, you know, as I look through a list that I'm going to give you in just a moment, I thought, hey, maybe I've been guilty of some of these things. We need to be careful, think through what it is we talk to people about. So here are a few examples from an article entitled, An Unintentional, Unwelcoming Welcome. And you'll find this article on a website that's called Outward OPC that was developed for this very reason to help us relate to people who are outside the church, to minister to them. Now, the article mainly addresses asking the wrong kinds of questions, but I'd just like to read it. So hopefully, are you going to display this so you'll be able to read this along with me? So it begins in this way. Often we tend to ask questions that we think are really helpful because they are things we understand and are excited about. But for an outsider, can be unsettling. These examples have all been heard many times by pastors and leaders. Example one, what's your church background? Or do you go to church? I don't know how many times I've asked that question. The problem, when an outsider visits a church, one of the most fearful things for them is being seen as an outsider, a pagan, a non-church going sinner. This question for many is the exact thing they fear. We would love to hear that a non-church-going person was visiting, but we need to think about our questions from their perspective as an outsider, not ours. Example number two, what did you think of the sermon? I, I don't ever ask that question. Um, or, <laughs> or the service, okay? I don't ask that question either, okay? Problem, we may be excited to hear what they thought, but they don't want to be put on the spot. They, of course, have to say something nice. But more than that, they now have to speak in your language and are worried that they may say something stupid or too simple. We aren't worried about that, but they are. Example number three, do you want to put your kids in the nursery? <laughs> okay. Problem. Seems harmless and even helpful, right? Another big fear for a visitor is what to do with kids. Will they be noisy? Will people look at me, think I'm a bad parent? They don't know what to do with their kids. They don't know nursery ages and policy. Asking this question puts them on the spot and may sound very suggestive. You should put your kids in the nursery. The topic of what to do with kids should probably be handled by a greeter or someone who is adept at helping visitors. Instead of asking this question, give them a welcoming, informative couple sentences about the kid's situation. For example, you have a couple options for your kids. Some people will have them in the nursery and you're welcome to do that. Others choose to put them, uh, oh, in the service, excuse me. Some people put them in the service, you're welcome to do that. Others choose to put them in a nursery. We have a nursery that for regulars is up to about age, and, and I think ours is four, yeah. But for newcomers, we are flexible as to what you think is best for your family. Older kids are just as welcome. Example number four, will you be coming back tonight? Problem? You are interested and excited for them to come back, but it's just remarkable that they came once. Evening church is a three-legged unicorn to an outsider. Give them a chance to breathe. Okay, so these are the things that we need to think about. How are the questions we're asking going to impact them? Not how they impact us, but think about from the perspective of somebody who's outside the church. So it goes on to ask this question, what should we say? Intentionally welcoming questions. Uh, when you do welcome visitors on a Sunday, one principle will be overwhelmingly helpful. Ask them questions about things they are interested in, not things you are interested in or interested in knowing about them. How old are your kids? What do they like to do? Are they in sports, dance, etc.? Note, this is a nice replacement for are your kids homeschooled? What do you do for a living? 
What does your typical day look like? What led you to that field work? What do you like to do for fun with free time? Have you done anything fun or interesting since moving here, if, if new to the area? Your goal should be to walk away able to give a nice bio of the normal things of life for this person. It's fine if they know very little about you, the church, or your theological prowess after your time uh, with them. I think there's some good counsel in here. I think, I think this is wise. And let me just summarize this by saying this. We shouldn't put people on the spot. We shouldn't pry into their personal business. We shouldn't give them our personal history. We need to tactfully draw theirs if that's what they want to talk about, right? We need to show them that we have a real interest in them as a person and we're not just trying to put a notch, as it were, on our Bibles. We need to put, you know, build a relationship because that's the only way we're going to have the opportunity to do them any real good. I think, above all, we should never get into a theological debate. Uh, one time I was greeting people years ago as they are going out the door and, and a gal asked a question. I thought it was an honest question. tried to give her an answer. And I could see that she was getting worked up and, and she actually asked a leading question to get into an argument. I said, you know, really, we shouldn't be talking about this right now. Maybe we can, you know, we can talk about this later and we get to know each other a little bit better. And there was also another occasion years ago when I was speaking at the front of the church with a gentleman who had visited an evening service, I think it was, could have, I think it was evening, and he was telling me that he believed in the continuance of the gift of tongues. And, and of course, I'm thinking, okay, well, I, I don't agree with that, but I don't want to necessarily confront him. And I was just, I was thinking about uh, how, how can I connect with him so that I can help him in some way on this issue. And, and at that moment, as I'm thinking those words, somebody from the back of the church just shouted out, hey, I heard you believe in speaking in tongues. Don't you know that that's wrong? And, and came marching up the aisle. Now, do you suppose we saw that person ever again? You know, no, we didn't. It just, it just blew them out of the church. We, we need to build relationships with people before we're going to be able to get into these kinds of issues with them. Give them time to acclimate and, and to learn. It, it takes a while, right? Now, here's just three final things we need to be aware of, and I'll close with this. And these were not addressed in this article, but things that I think we'll all agree are, are valid. First of all, as we're meeting visitors, we need to avoid invading their personal space. Now, I think most of us know what that means, but there are some people who seem to be unaware of it, and you just get too close to them, you know, when, when we're talking. If we see somebody who's trying to back up away from us, you know, I mean, that sometimes when I've had people come to me who are invading my space, you know, I, I, I just, I kind of take a step back and leave my foot forward, you know, so that I can put some space and they can't move closer to me. It's, people have their personal space and we need to make sure we respect that. Okay, that's one. Secondly, we should never pick up a visitor's child. Okay, I, sometimes that seems like it goes without saying, but that's not always the case. You should never pick up somebody else's child unless you have their permission. Now, this goes double for, for men, just picking up somebody's child. Uh, you need to talk uh, to the parents. You, you, as a matter of fact, I think you shouldn't even address the children necessarily unless that child, he or she, happens to be with their parent or, you know, until the parents get to know you a little bit better. I mean, we have a family that's been visiting, has several small children. They run up here after every service, sadly, for, for us, not for them, but sadly, he's a minister looking for a call, and we'd love to have them here. Their kids are, are just such a delight to have. But after the service, they, they always march up here and stand right in front of me, and they want to thank me for the sermon because that's what their parents have taught them to do. And but they have their parents' permission, and I can talk with them, and it's just a delight to be able to talk with them. But people coming for the first time, if I stepped out and started talking to their children individually, I, I think that would be threatening to the parents. See, parents don't want to feel that their children are being threatened in any way. Now, finally, let me just say this with regard to one other thing we need to be careful about, because I, I've heard feedback on it um, you know, over the years. Men should not engage visiting women by themselves. I think we should welcome them, but at a, you know, at a, at a comfortable distance, we should you know, welcome them, but not corner them in a conversation because that makes them feel uncomfortable. 
If she happens to be married, don't speak to her if you're a man unless she's with her husband or unless you are with your wife. If she happens to be single or, or perhaps separated from her husband, let your wife or another woman talk to her and, and get to know her. And I think the same thing is true the other way around as well. We just need to be careful. And this is a sensitive area. I mean, particularly in today's uh, political climate, right? The uh, Me Too movement. We need to be very, very careful. And I think if you study the scriptures, I was thinking about this during the week. Can you think of one example where Jesus was alone with a woman? You know, he wouldn't want that aspersion or the accusations that might come against him for that. He was with his disciples or he was with others in the room at the same time. I can't think of one example when Jesus was alone with, with a woman, except perhaps for the case where they threw the woman in front of, her, of him and accused her, but I think even his disciples were present at that particular juncture. So we just need to be careful, careful that we don't unnecessarily offend, careful that we welcome, make people feel comfortable, that we get to know them, that we love them, try to build a relationship with them in order that we might in the future help them. If we try to help them with what we perceive to be their problems, right out of the bat, we're not going to see them again. That, that's just the way it is. So may the Lord help us to be Christ to our visitors so that we might, by His grace, be able to do them some real good. Well, let's, um, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to help us uh, do this.